Welcome back to the Chem OG. Today we're continuing our discussion of isomers, and specifically what we're going to take a look at today are geometric isomers. Geometric isomers are a type of stereoisomer, and if you recall, stereoisomers are ones in which we have to break apart a bond and reform it elsewhere in order to convert one type of that stereoisomer, one uh, instance of that stereoisomer to the other. And so the bonds that we could break in order to form one stereoisomer from another with respect to geometric isomers are either a pi bond. And so here's an example in which a pi bond is something that needs to be broken in order to make this molecule look like this one. So uh, notice that this carbon right here is sort of facing down and this carbon here is kind of going up. So the only way to make these two molecules look alike is to break this pi bond and switch things around. Uh, another type of bond that we would need to break, which we can't do easily, is a ring. And so if I take a look at this ring right over here, in order to make this amine, which is facing away from us, move towards us, I would have to break this carbon nitrogen bond and break the other carbon hydrogen bond and switch things around. Or I would have to move things around in the ring where I break bonds inside the ring and then I reform them elsewhere. And so these molecules are not mirror images of each other. These molecules are not mirror images of each other. And that is a special type of stereoisomer that we call a diastereomer. So we'll expand on diastereomers a little bit more, but that's the reason that geometric isomers are a type of diastereomer is that they're not mirror images of each other. And so a common way to differentiate one geometric isomer from another is to use the term cis and trans, whether things are together or whether they are far apart. And so here in this example, um, if we take a look at this pi bond, I'm going to draw a line right through that pi bond, imaginary line through that pi bond. And what I'm going to take a look at is where are the carbons relative to this line? So I noticed that the connecting carbons, this one over here and this one over here, are both below this line. So they're both on the same side of that pi bond. And that means that the isomer up top is the cis isomer. If I were to draw that line on the other version of the molecule, I would notice that this carbon is on one side of the line, this carbon is on the other side of the line, they're not on the same side of the line, they're on opposite sides, so that would be an example of a trans isomer instead. So for these two fatty acids, cis and trans to describe them work just fine, right? And we've heard of trans fatty acids and cis fatty acids, and so that's where that term comes from. And if I were to take a look at the amines, one on either side, well, um, the what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the amine and its position in space to where the methyl group is in terms of its position in space. So the methyl group here is coming towards us, whereas the amine is going away from us. So that means that the isomer on the left is the trans isomer, whereas the isomer on the right is the cis isomer instead. Okay, so in, in terms of substituents on a ring, we would compare where they are relative to each other. Um, and if you're looking at this in a chair conformation, you would take note and see if they're both up together, both down together, that would be a cis, or if they're opposite one another, that would be the trans isomer. All right. Sometimes though, cis and trans can be an ambiguous way of referring to a molecule. So let's take a look at these two isomers. So if I'm taking a look at the molecule that's on the left, I'll notice that my methyl group on the left and the methyl group on the right side of this double bond are cis to each other, right? So that's an observation that I can make is that both of them are above the imaginary line that we drew earlier, and so the methyl groups are cis to one another. But a lot of times in terms of reactivity and in terms of physical properties, what we're concerned about is where are the bulky groups relative to each other? And so the bulkier group on the left-hand side is the methyl group here, and the bulky group on the right-hand side is the ethyl group here. And the two bulky groups are actually trans to each other. Because remember, on the left-hand side, there's an implicit hydrogen. And so the methyl group is much larger um, than the hydrogen that's by itself. So the two bulky groups on the molecule on the left are trans to each other. Okay. And if I make that same analysis, if I use that same designation on the isomer on the right, everything's going to be the opposite. Because my two methyl groups are trans to each other in this isomer, one's over here on top of the line and the other one's over here at the bottom of the line on the opposite side of the line. And so the two, the two 
um, bulkhead groups are cis with one another, but the two methyl groups are trans to one another. So you see how we came up with cis and trans for both molecules and it's all sorts of confused and mixed up. So we need a much more unambiguous way or a clearer way in order to be able to determine what kind of isomer we're looking at. And so in order to do that, we use E and Z configurations because those are a lot less ambiguous. So what E and Z look at are using the CIP rules, the Conningle prelog rules that we determined from before, to take a look at the, C, the two attached atoms that are to the left of the double bond. And we're going to apply the rules in order to be able to determine which one is a higher priority. Okay, so those are the same rules that we use to determine absolute configuration. If you'll recall, we take a look at atomic number first, and then after that, we take a look at mass number. And if two uh, attached atoms are the same in terms of their atomic number and mass number, we go farther down the line in order to be able to determine a point of difference. But immediately what you're looking at is the two atoms that are attached. You're not looking far down, you know, in terms of uh, the substituent. All you're taking a look at is the immediately bonded atom. Again, much like we do with CIP rules. So we're going to do that on the left hand side. We're going to apply those same rules to the right hand side. And then wherever it is that the two higher priority atoms are is going to determine whether the molecule is E or Z. So if your two higher priority atoms are on the same side as one another, then you're looking at the Z configuration. If they're on opposite sides of each other, then we're going to say that they're on eposite sides of each other. And so E and Z come from German words. And so that's the reason for the awful, awful sort of play on words that we have over here. But at least it's a way to be able to remember which one is E and which one is Z. So Z is same side. And a lot of people remember that as Z is analogous to cis in terms of two things being on the same side. So you can almost say instead of cis, you can say zis, right? And that would serve the same purpose. Whichever way that you use to be able to remember which one's which is totally fine, so long as you um, are able to account for things properly. So let's apply that to um, the two molecules we were taking, the uh, two isomers we were taking a look at earlier for uh, two pentene. And so, or really three methyl two pentene. And so here, what I got is if I draw that line, if I take a look at which one is a higher priority uh, atom on the left hand side, here I have a carbon atom, and over here I have a hydrogen atom. And so the higher priority on the left hand side is going to be the carbon. And on the right hand side, I have a carbon here versus a carbon there. So that's not really a point of difference, but this carbon is bonded to another carbon, whereas this carbon is only bonded to hydrogens. So that means that this carbon down here is going to be a higher priority. And so my two higher priority groups are on opposite sides of my imaginary line from earlier. And that means that the isomer that I'm looking at here is the E isomer because my higher priority atoms are on opposite sides from each other. So notice I'm careful to say that the higher priority atoms, we're only taking a look at the carbon and comparing it to the carbon up top. I'm only taking a look at the carbon here and comparing it to the hydrogen. I'm not going down farther down the line. Uh, this isomer has everything in the opposite end. So my higher priority methyl group is on the left hand side here. And this is my uh, higher priority carbon compared to the carbon down there. And so both these guys are on the same side of the uh, double bond, so they're on the same side, and that means that I'm looking at the Z isomer for the isomer on the right. Okay, so much less ambiguity when we talk about E and Z isomers in comparison to cis and trans. So anytime you talk about cis and trans, you can always apply E and Z. Okay, so let's take a look at an example problem. Here we have a double bond, and we're going to use the same steps in order to be able to determine whether it's an E isomer on the, or the Z isomer. So we're going to take a look at the um, two atoms that are attached to the left side of my double bond. So over here up top, I have a carbon, and that carbon has a whole bunch of oxygens attached to it. But over here, I have a fluorine. And remember, the first thing we compare is atomic number. And so this fluorine has an atomic number of 9, and this carbon has an atomic number of 6. So regardless of what's bonded to the carbon or how oxidized it is, all those things don't matter in terms of the uh, CIP rules that we learned. So the fluorine is going to be a higher priority bonded atom than the carbon will ever be. And if I take a look at the right-hand side, 
I have a carbon that I'm comparing with a nitrogen. Nitrogen has an atomic number of seven. Carbon has an atomic number of six. And so that means that nitrogen is going to win out. So both of these higher priority atoms are on the same side of the double bond. They're both below. So that means that I'm looking at two uh, higher priority groups that are on the same side of the double bond. And so this would be the Z isomer. So again, I will reiterate, it doesn't matter how long the carbon chain is. It doesn't matter how oxidized the particular carbon atom is. Always make sure to apply the CIP rules in order of hierarchy, starting with atomic number, then by mass number, and then you take a look at points of difference afterwards. Thank you for watching today's lesson. Don't forget to like and subscribe.